The Cannabis Conversation. A European perspective on the emerging legal cannabis industry. Welcome to the Cannabis Conversation with Anuj Desai, where we explore the new legal cannabis industry by speaking to the professionals that are helping to shape it. On today's show, I have Mark Reinders. Mark is CEO of Hemp Flax, which is the largest independent grower and processor of industrial hemp in Europe. Mark is also a board member of IA, which is the European Industrial Hemp Association. Mark, welcome. Yeah, thank you for uh, having me in the show. Yeah, pleasure, pleasure. How are you getting on with... Uh lockdown or the end of lockdown no technically good we in the netherlands didn't have that strict lockdown like you and has seen in other countries we were still able to run the company and yeah we are a production company so it's difficult for my employees to work at home so it's difficult to bring them a bale of hemp straw and tell them to process it at home so the guys came to the factory of course we took all the measurements the total number of people we reduced in one room you know keeping your distance and also in the offices and a few office members work from home but i decided to go to the office because i think if my employees have to come to the factory to run the factory i feel obliged to be here as well absolutely well that's good that things are okay <laughs> and yeah. that the business is still carrying on yeah why don't we start there, actually, you know, so a bit about your background and how you got into hemp and how you started Hemp Flax and maybe tell people a bit about what Hemp Flax does. Yeah. Uh, long story short, myself, I did not start Hemp Flax. It was Ben Dronkers, a uh, famous cannabis entrepreneur who started uh, Hemp Flax in the early 90s, 1994 to be exactly. So we celebrated last year, big time, our 25th year anniversary in the industry. And Ben actually started this company with the vision to revive the industrial hemp industry. Because as you know, industrial hemp in the past, it was a big crop. You know, sales of the ships were being made out of cannabis, cannabis textile, the ropes, the clothing. A lot of hemp was being used in the industry. But then the prohibition came, the narcotic law, the anti-narcotic law, where all the hemp was prohibited, including industrial hemp, because there was no distinguishing between industrial hemp and uh, marijuana. So for about 50 years, there was no industrial hemp industry anymore. So Ben also owns the museum in Amsterdam and nowadays also the one in Barcelona, the Hemp Marijuana Museum. And from the museum, he told people about the historical use of industrial hemp. And people told him, listen, it's not going to happen anymore. Uh, It will never come back. And actually, he started Hemp Flasks with only one single reason to prove that those people were wrong and that hemp can be a modern-day crop. So if you look today that we supply fibers for the BMW 3 and 5 series, for the Mercedes SC and A type, for the Jaguar and the Bentley, and we supply even fibers for the Bentley and the Bugatti Veyron, I think uh, he made his point after 25 years. And for me personally, I'm not that old that I started the company uh, 25 years ago because I was still uh, going to high school at that time. But my father is the local farmer and he started growing hemp as one of the first farmers in the region here, uh, close to the factory for hemp flax. And uh, I liked the crop a lot at that day, more because I didn't have to go in on my holidays to remove the weeds because, as you know, hemp is growing that fast. It doesn't need uh, any uh, manual labor to remove the weeds. So I like the crop for that reason. But if you get older and when I did my egg studies, I decided to do an internship at Hemflex in early 2000. And I learned about the crop and the possibilities. And uh, actually, after I finished my my internship, I always stayed in contact up to 2007. Ben asked me to come back and lead Hemflex. And I uh, started doing that in 2008. Fantastic. Brilliant. And so, yeah, before we get on to talking about industrial hemp in a bit more detail, we recently had Catherine Wilson, who is also working with IA, which is the European Industrial Hemp Association. Would you mind telling us a bit about your involvement with that as well? Yeah, uh, IA is very important for the industry because all of the companies, and even the, if you have a company with a size like ours, you are still not able to 
influence the politics or do good proper lobbying work in Brussels and in order to get regulations or situations that work in favor of the industry and you need to cooperate there and the European International Hemp Association is a great platform to do that and now the hemp industry is growing fast the industry association is growing fast as well and since two years we have now a professional lobbyist hired and the second one hired recently as well uh, working in Brussels, situated in Brussels, and actually know where to go to, to with politicians are influential on special topics in which not, you know, I did it myself for quite a long time, but it's very difficult to have those connections. It's a full-time job, and I'm very happy uh, that I can afford themselves now a lobbyist to do that. And it's very important because hemp is still, you know, doesn't get a recognition it deserves. Too many people are still mixing it up with marijuana. Uh, you now you have the CBD oil. It's sometimes called hush oil. Well, we know it's two f- different things. But politicians are sometimes still a, bit, a little bit scared about regulation. For example, from our country where we are in the Netherlands, we are not allowed to harvest the flower and the leaves. Because officially, hemp is still prohibited uh, into the narcotic laws. In the Netherlands, uh, cannabis is a Schedule two drug. So it's prohibited to grow, to possess, to transport, to to deal, whatever. And what you see that most countries are still, because cannabis is a scheduled drug, they made exemption rules for industrial hemp. And each country made an exemption rule in its own way. And in the Netherlands, they made an exemption. You know, it's not prohibited if you grow it for fiber and seeds. So leaves and flowers are not included in this. Mm-hmm. So technically, I cannot harvest flower and leaves. But 10 kilometers in the east way, that way, 10 kilometers is Germany. There we do it. There we harvest flower and leaves. So there's no one Europe regarding that. And in our farm in Romania, we own a farm in Romania as well, including factory of about 1,000 hectares. There we harvest the flower and leaves of CBD as well. So this actually is a great example on how legislation and regulation is differentiating in each country. Yeah, we have a similar situation in the UK as well. And, you know, we'll go on to talk about some of these things. Just on the lobbying side, I think it's really interesting what you say. And don't get me wrong, that's a long way to go. But have you found in recent years that things have slightly started to move and change? Or is it still a massive issue? No, it's changing. It's definitely changing. It's changing in our favor. Uh, You see, of course, we're not going that far like in Canada that completely legalized cannabis. And for us, and speaking from an industrial perspective, it's not really necessary to do that. But what we would like to see is having a clear legal position of industrial hemp in the law. And that we do not have working under an exemption rule, but that we just fully legalized in the legislation. But I see politicians, associations, scientists are getting less and less scared about cannabis and speaking more about the positive effects. And of course, I think the whole CBD explosion also helped a lot in that because you know we can do so much with the cannabinoids although we only focused all the years on fighting one and there's thc and there's the only psychoactive one and the delta 9 thc so all the other cannabinoids can have such great value to food and feed systems and and food supplements and medication so i really feel the the attitude towards uh, hemp and cannabis is changing i i see it myself i'm now 12 years in in charge of hemp flex and when i told 12 years ago somebody i work from hemp company is oh you're probably stoned all day and uh, you're having space cake uh, for lunch and uh, that kind of stuff and now if i tell people i work from hemp company they start telling me, oh, great, you can make textiles out of it, you build cars out of it, houses. So people start telling me what you can do with hemp. It's a little bit like telling the Pope he's Catholic, but in the talks I have with people, you see that the attitude of public opinion changed also. Big That's time. good. And it must be nice for you having worked for so long at it that you're now starting to see people really engaging with it. And look, that, that's exactly what I want from you. I want you to tell me about it. So yeah. um, moving kind of nicely on, I mean, hemp flax is great because it really does use the whole plant, you know, and if we're to put it into three big categories, it's probably CBD or, you know, the flowers, cannabinoids, um, uh, food, seeds, and then industrial hemp. And uh, we'd be great to talk about the industrial hemp side with you. So uh, use as a material. Um, Maybe you can just give us a broad summary on, you know, some of the real qualities of hemp that make it a great material. 
how much time uh, do I have? <laughs> Very uh, big. Uh, because what I always say is that the biggest advantage of hemp is more or less in the same time the biggest disadvantage because it's such a multifunctional crop. And for a company like ours, we do the whole crop approach you mentioned earlier before because it's very important. Because you see now, for example, in the U.S., it's CBD focused only. 99% of the hemp grown in the U.S. was the CBD. There's no, almost no single fiber crop there. All the hemp grown in Canada outdoors was for seed and they were focused completely on seed. And we in Europe, we mostly grow for fiber only. And actually, I don't believe in a single use for hemp because uh, the growing and the harvesting and the processing is too expensive so if you take all those revenue streams from the crop you capitalize on them you are able to get a more profitable company but it's also difficult because you're active in a lot of markets i told you before we are supplying fibers to the car industry but we are also doing building construction industry where we supply fibers and insulation material uh, but on the other hand, we also in the animal industry where we supply bedding for rabbits and guinea pigs and we supply CBD for pharma and food supplements. So that's difficult to manage because in the morning you have a discussion with a pet shop chain why they should start selling hemp bedding. Then you go to a construction site and, and discuss why they should use hemp insulation. In the evening, you have a meeting with a pharmacological company and speak about CBD and medicine. So all those topics in one house is very, uh, very difficult to manage. But that's why we split our company in business lines and each business line is being managed by a, a sales manager that has a specialism in that area. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine it's quite, as you say, there's so many uses. So yeah, maybe we could talk about some of those number that's frequently sort of circulated is, is over 10,000 uses for hemp. Can you highlight some of the main ones that, you know, you guys have just, I think, bought an insulation company or, yeah, or moving to correct. that space? Yeah, that's very fresh and I'm very happy and proud that we managed to acquire this asset. It was on my uh, of an R wish list for a very long time. We acquired a production line for the production of hemp insulation. So we used to supply fiber to hemp insulation manufacturers in Europe and our insulation manufacturers. But now, and we will start selling hemp insulation in the market as well, but being produced by third parties. And by the acquisition of this company, we are able to supply and produce our own insulation materials and we can add value to our fiber. And actually by integrating this insulation production in the supply chain we have here, we make the supply chain shorter and we will be able to be more competitive in the market because the supply chains of sustainable building materials these days are too long. And you have a farmer, first processor, trader, producer, trader, transport, logistics. It's very long and each part of the supply chain needs to earn its money, profit, margin. And the next step is going to calculate its profit and margin on the profit and margin of the step before. So that's called the bullwhip effect. And by taking down the supply chain in one hand, we are far more efficient. And looking at the market, if you probably know, 40% uh, of the worldwide CO2 emission is being caused by construction and buildings. So building, construct the buildings and heating or cooling the buildings. And we can not solve the whole problem, but a part, especially in the energy, which goes in in the, in the construction phase. Because if you insulate your house, for example, with glass fiber insulation, next to the fact that it's very itchy to work with it, and I don't know if you ever use it yourself, but it's very itchy and irritating to work with glass fiber insulation, and could be very unhealthy as well, is that the production of hemp insulation needs 10 times less energy compared to the production of glass fiber insulation. Glass fiber insulation being made from sand and recycled glass, but it's being melted with 1,500 degrees Celsius. And actually, we have way less energy input. And on top of that, the crop is taking CO2 from the sky while it's growing, like every plant is doing, and hemp especially, fairly well. And we fix more CO2 during the, the growing process than is being emitted in the processing process. So we have a positive CO2 footprint. So we fix CO2 for 60, 70 years eh, as long as the house exists. So 
we need to insulate our houses more and more. We have in Western Europe a massive amount of houses with bad insulation that needs restoration works, needs reinstallation, but also the new buildings needs to meet high insulation standards. And if you do that with a natural renewable material, you have an environmental gain from the day one. Mm. And for the owner of the house itself, it's way better because the internal climate in your house is much better. If you have insulate with other products, mineral products, you need to glue your whole house with plastic and foil to keep moisture levels out. So actually, you're living in a plastic bag. And if your ventilation system is not working properly, you get fungi and molds, an unhealthy environment. And hemp fiber installation is being built into a breathable wall systems. So it absorbs the moisture, humidity, and releases it. It's regulating the air humidity in your house on a natural way. So giving you a higher comfort level in your house. So it's really a building material that's being asked and asked more by the people to use in their house. Yeah, there's loads there. So there's the, the, the CO2, which is obviously one of the biggest issues that we face, but... Does it continue to absorb CO2? Have I got that right? No, no, the fiber insulation not because when we cut down the plants, the assimilation process stops and it stops uh, taking up CO2. There's another product made from hemp called Hempcrete. And that's the hemp shive, the, the core of the hemp plant uh, in combination with lime. And uh, actually the wall behind me is made from that. And hydrated lime, when it gets wet, it starts a process called a carbonization process. And during the carbonization process, it takes the CO2 from the sky and absorbs it and releases the O2. And by doing that, it takes the C uh, from the CO2 and it gets harder over time. Ah, great. Okay, cool. Yeah, because I knew about hempcrete continuing to have those qualities, but so I wondered whether the same applied to insulation as well. That's great. And, and you guys also are doing some stuff in bioplastics, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. We uh, have a uh, production line here that's able to pelletize the fiber because the problem with hemp fiber is if you want to add it to plastics, you have to dose it and dose that fiber coming out from production lines a little bit like sheep wool it's very fluffy and sticking together it's very difficult to dose and what we do is we make pellets little fiber packages and we can add the polymer to it, it can be a recycled pp synthetic or there can be a pla a biopolymer and any other biopolymer available we can blend it and we make these little packages and those packages we can feed into an injection rolling machine where we can replace up to 50% of the plastics we can replace by hemp. So I see a lot of time the term hemp plastic, but hemp itself is not a plastic. Hemp is a fiber. It's a re reinforcer. So you add the fiber to the polymers and you get a composite that is stronger because the fiber is giving strength to the composite part and weight reduction. In a, almost like a, a mesh? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and is that separate to cellulose? There's that of course in injection molding. You have cellulose filling, but uh, a lot is being used in injection molding where you need parts with constructive properties, mechanical constructive properties. They add glass fiber to it, and actually also here we replace glass fiber a little bit like we do in the car industry. In the car industry, it's uh, press molded parts where there's an, a non-woven of hemp being put in the mold, the polymer is being applied on it, and then it presses, and you have a door panel. And why is, uh, for example, I mentioned before, Bugatti Veyron using hemp? Now, they're not using it to give this 1,000 horsepower car a green image at the end of the day, because we, look, we have hemp inside. They use hemp because of the mechanical properties, because they obtain a weight reduction, because hemp fiber is lighter compared to carbon fiber, so they have a weight reduction. And they use hemp for the mechanical properties. And personally, I like that. Not that we sell a lot of fiber to the Bugatti Veyron because those cars they built a year. While well, I tell you this, the factory produced already what they need for a whole year. But the idea that hemp can be better compared to synthetic or non-sustainable components, that's a good argument to sell because sustainability itself as a selling argument does not work you know you need to sell it because it's better people are not going to buy something that's sustainable because they want to save the world people are very selfish they buy stuff because they want to get better and if you supply them with better materials that gives them better mechanical properties uh, better living standards uh, better well-being and so on what they improve themselves and you can do that in a sustainable way you can make a market mm. 
Yeah, really good point to make there, actually. You know, exactly. People aren't going to accept an inferior product it just because it's sustainable. But the amazing thing about hemp is you can actually have superior products on many of these aspects. Exactly. And if you're able to supply superior products, people are willing to buy it. And if people are buying it, you increase the sustainability. Yeah, fantastic. And just before we move on to some other bits, a couple of the other main sort of selling points, if you like, of hemp that I'm aware of are, one of them is its fire retardant qualities. It's the cellulose fiber. So compared to uh, glass fiber and rock wool fiber, it burns relatively easily because those are mineral fibers. Actually, we add quite a lot of soda to the products to reduce the fire risk. But uh, we are working on projects to increase the fire retardancy of the fiber. Right. Fantastic. Well, that's new knowledge for me. (laughs) And then what about the biofuel angle? Biofuel is a good discussion. Technically, hemp seeds gives oil. So you can uh, refine the oil into biodiesel. But I think there are other crops that give more oil per hectare than hemp does. Although you have with one hectare of hemp, you have also the fiber and the shives and uh, the leaves and flowers. So you have much, much more revenue streams than only the oil. Burning, let's say the wood shives, you can burn it. Actually, we are heating our offices in the Netherlands and Romania on hemp shives. But we take the shives that, you know, we sweep them off on the floor. We're not suitable for selling, so it's less or waste shives we burn here. But personally, the energetic use of biomass, I think it's the, the lowest biomass use you can have in the valuation. So first, you have to grow biomass of food. That's the most important thing, food and medicine. Then the material use, clothing, construction, building, material. And then when you finish the whole biorefinery steps, the waste streams you have that you can transfer into energy. So bioenergy itself, I think it's a great idea. It's a great thing to use. We still have to use. But growing crops for bioenergy goal purposes only, I don't think that's a smart thing to do. Yeah, really Thank you for clarifying that. I guess it's the focus of why you're growing and what you intend yeah. to do with it yeah. is very important. Yeah. Cool. So let's talk about some of the practical challenges that hemp faces. As a crop and harvesting the crop, are there any specific issues that hemp faces versus other crops? Oh, yes. It's one of the most difficult crops you can harvest because it's a fiber crop. If you look at the history of hemp flax in the first years, we destroyed so many egg machines, you cannot imagine. Burned down combines, uh, sickle bar mowers completely destroyed. It took us quite a few years to modernize the, the hemp harvest. And actually, we had patented hemp harvesters. But over more than 20 years, we had a patent on the hemp mower we developed and the technology we are still using. And at the moment today, we are working with, uh, for example, uh, leading brands like John Deere, where we uh, built modification kits for John Deere combines called the double cut systems, where you can add on your combine as an attachment and the header takes the tops of the plant uh, with the seeds and the leaves and the flower that will be separated in the combine in seeds and leaves and flower revenue streams. And the lower header, it's a, a modified header that takes the remaining stalks and cut them pieces to dry and red in the field. And on the back of the combine, we've developed a trailer to collect the leaves and the flowers so we can collect them in a clean way. They're not touching the land and we move them into containers for uh, drying in our own drying installation. Right. the whole streamlining the CBD production. So with one and, combine, we can harvest three revenue streams at once. Wow. Wow. And I can imagine if you're talking about many, many hectares, anything that provides efficiency in you harvesting is going to increase your bottom line, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so on a wider issue around hemp, is there a kind of, is one of the major challenges market demand? Do not enough people know about hemp yet? Is it almost like a PR issue? More people need to realize how wonderful this this plant is. I think that, you know, you see a lot of associations and conferences and the whole CBD thing put hemp in the forefield of news and media coverage. So it's getting better, but we're still not there. And I think this whole Corona thing can could work out very positive because more and more people are now saying, okay, we have to rebuild the economy, but yeah, please let us do that this time in a more sensible and sustainable way. 
And you see that also the governments are giving aids to companies, but only under the condition that they are going to meet certain sustainability goals. Of course, you have to rebuild the economy, but isn't this a great, great opportunity to do that not based on oil and gas and other fossil-based materials, but uh, make the transition, force the transition to a more sustainable economy uh, right now? So I think there's a huge opportunity laying ahead for us. And that's one of the reasons we decided to acquire this asset of insulation manufacturing, because, yeah, we expect this will set through in a big time. Cool. Okay. thank you for that. I really, really hope so. So maybe I can just ask you some practical questions on hemp, which I really want the answer to. So I was sort of told that, you know, with the plant, this was almost like the holy trinity. You've got the seeds, stalk and the flower. But as I've learned more about just agriculture in general, it appears that obviously people choose certain strains because one aspect of that. So, you know, they'll they'll choose a particular strain because it produces the biggest, highest quality seeds. Are you guys trying to look for a strain that can provide all three at a good level? Yeah. Does that thing exist yet? Or is there a. Yeah, there are varieties that just give you enough seeds, are pure seed varieties, and they give you bad fiber yields. They say short and bad quality fiber. There are pure fibers that doesn't give you any CBD, but good biomass and good fiber yield. Uh, we're looking for those multi purpose varieties in case of seed, CBD, and fiber. But I always say you have to pick your sweetheart. You have to decide on which revenue stream you're going to optimize and that one you take as, as your main product then you have to accept that on seed or cbd yield you're lower you know uh, we're not working with varieties that give you eight nine percent cbd you know our varieties are, are lower than that but because of the volume we have is we do 2400 hectares a year you know we still have a massive amount of cbd just because of the massive volume we have but in our company we are a fiber company and we optimize on fiber and we take the seeds and the CBD as revenue, side revenue streams. Right, okay. So you've focused on the fiber, okay. Are there two of them that are kind of slightly more better suited? Like, is there a point of efficiency between the three, you know, or is it you really just have to focus on one out of the three and the other two are bonus sort of thing? Yeah, but you can do some influence on that as well. It has to do with fertilizers, sowing density, sowing moment. And you cannot take the same variety and plant in every country, you know. Some plants was do very well in the northern part of Europe, do bad in the southern part of Europe. But believe me, after 25 years, we made all mistakes you can think about. Uh, some mistakes we even made twice, to be sure. Uh, <laughs> and, and after 25 years, we know pretty much uh, what works and what doesn't work. Cool. And so presumably, you must have lots of different varieties that you're growing for different purposes yeah, we, in we work on different in jurisdictions company, in our company we work on efforts with, with with six seven varieties for romania and for the netherlands and for purposes yeah and are you developing any genetics as well as yes. you go along yes we do we uh, part of the group is a gene bank with about 500 different uh, genetics of 600 in the moment and we crossbreeding it and we do selection and we're looking for new varieties and new products all the time continuously yeah fantastic cool okay well look i mean as we get towards the end it would be kind of you know silly to not mention covid i mean we've, you've talked touched on it already but how do you feel it's going to affect the industry and have you seen anything already that would indicate any sort of trends or is it too early to tell yeah I think the big crisis will come later. Now, a lot of government support is there to help through, but I think the real financial crisis will come later. But again, I'm convinced that we are relatively crisis-proof because of the diversified business model we have and the desire to go to a more sustainable economy. So let's say I'm more happy being active in the hemp industry than in the oil industry for this moment of time. (laughs) That's a good position to be in. Cool. Okay, well, look, my trademark final question is, Is what did your family say when you told them that you were moving into the hemp slash cannabis industry? Yeah, no, they were very happy, of course, because well, my father was one of the first hemp farmers, so uh, he could understand. And uh, he still is a hemp farmer, and he has to. He doesn't have a choice anymore. He has to grow hemp. <laughs> he gets for Christmas from me always a contract for the next season. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, they were very positive, and they understand uh, why we're doing this. And actually, 
my my family is also involved my wife is working as well in the company now and yeah if you work in hemp it's very addictive and then in the positive way of the word because you see more possibilities uh, than you have time and money to capitalize on yeah yeah fantastic i'm glad you're turning it into a family business <laughs> but yeah like there's so much good stuff to talk about hemp and um, we could talk for hours on it but thank you for sparing the time today it's been great to learn a bit more about it and we'd love to have you back on at some point good. to, to follow Always the free to ask me great cool thank you very much mark cheers